I suspected that I might be positive because um, when I was going out with the person that I contracted HIV from, uh, I found out from some other people that um, he was really sexually promiscuous, that he'd had a lot of sex partners. And um, it was kind of like when he wasn't with me, he was with somebody else. And I didn't know until after I'd started going out with him that he was like that. And then I went through a period where I thought, no, people like me don't get it. You know, because I really believe those things that, you know, only homosexuals get it and bisexuals and intravenous drug users and people who are promiscuous. Not only his he was only my third partner, so I, and I didn't consider myself promiscuous and I'm not a homosexual male or bisexual and I don't shoot drugs, so I didn't think I was going to get it. Hi, my name is Trudy Parsons. I'm with the Newfoundland Labrador AIDS Committee. Um, some of you may know that I am HIV positive, and today we're going to talk about HIV and AIDS in Newfoundland. By next year, many, many Canadian families will either have a family member infected with AIDS or HIV, or they will have a close family friend that will be infected. And that kind of, you know, makes me go, wow, like next year. And that's already happening in some of our rural, rural communities here in Newfoundland and in the rest of Canada. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't think there's any HIV in my community, but uh, I've heard a few rumors, so I don't know. Well, in my community, I know of two specific cases, but I mean, there's millions of rumors flying around. In my community, I'm gonna say, in around where I live, there's a lot. Apparently, and like even one of my friends has it. I, I'm person. I'm a personal friend with a person with HIV, and there's you wouldn't. It's very surprising how many people around have contracted HIV virus. It's it's amazing actually. I haven't been into a community yet in Newfoundland, and I've traveled all around this province where there hasn't been someone infected, or there hasn't been somebody there who knew somebody, or that person left the community, or they came to Newfoundland for a little while, or something like that. People say it's in this community, it's in that community, it's in every community. Well, the major way it's spread is someone, either knowingly or not knowingly, sleeps with one person and then that person sleeps with someone else. It's almost like a chain reaction. Like when a person will leave a community, chances are, well, they get into a community, it will come from a bigger place, like people going out and come back, like Natalie said. But when the person comes back, they might not necessarily know that they have HIV, and then they might mess around with someone out around here, and then it'll just be spread throughout the whole community without anybody knowing, until someone decides to finally get tested and see. There's not a lot to do around. Usually people just call someone up who has a car, and that person picks everyone up and just drives around, and just stops here and there for about 10 minutes and then moves on. People usually go in the woods and down on Moses Rocks drinking. Uh, if somebody's parents are gone away, if you tell two people you're having a party, you end up with half the town there. <laughs> During like weekdays, you see more people doing dope, but on the weekends, it's more alcohol or basically a combination. Getting some real. The Newfoundland Labrador AIDS Committee is doing an ongoing adolescent sexuality study. It's not really quite formulated, but the stuff that is done so far. Um, is telling us that 80% of our youth are sexually active from grades 10 to 12. 40% uh, of them are using condoms, but infrequently, and the other 40% are not using them at all. If they think, well, you know, kids aren't as sexually active as you know, most people say they are, that's, that's being ignorant. I mean, they just don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> you drive, you can park a car. If you don't have a car, you can go find to a field. Go, find go, yeah. Yeah, go, go to a field and behind a rock in someone someone's with a house. Car. Camping, anywhere at parties usually when uh, like yeah. the parents are gone out like um bedrooms. that's where people usually get together and drink and have sex i mean there's a there's a party in the house people the bedrooms are you gotta call in advance make reservations you drink and then you go upstairs yeah it's like a routine <laughs> once you uh had a had a few uh a few beers or some liquor or whatever your uh, your value system can be uh, you know put aside for a while you don't really care about it as much and you can um you probably attempt something that you wouldn't normally, that you can regret later on. You look back and say, why did I do that? <laughs> you know, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in doing things like this. I'd say alcohol probably helps the spread of AIDS, and same with drugs. I mean, people under the influence of alcohol and drugs um, are less careful than they would be if they weren't.
they get loaded drunk or something, right? And your hands don't work very good. <laughs> so, you know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of hard to roll one on. <laughs> That's why you should put it on before you leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> good job for you, Barry. Our sexuality study is also showing that the average age for beginning sexual activity is 15 for boys and 14 for girls, and some are even younger than that. The right age is, I guess, when, uh, when you're ready. The right age, I think, is when you meet a guy and you're committed and you love each other, and uh, you think he's mature enough and you're mature enough, and then I guess if you really feel that you're ready, you go for it. There's no set age. It's like you can't say, well, I have to wait until I'm 16 or I have to wait until I'm 13. Like, there's no set age. It's like everybody's different, so everybody is ready at a different time. And it's just, as they say, you know when you're ready. And if you're, if you're not ready before, then you shouldn't be pressured into it. It seems like there are younger people are always trying to impress the older people, like yeah. saying, oh, you know, if <clears> I drink and if I have sex and that, I'll be just as cool as they are, and they'll think I'm cool. Because, you know, they'll say, oh, well, you're not doing kiddie things, you're doing cool things. They jump directly from G.I. Joe to condoms, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's I mean, there's, no, leave. <laughs> there's no intermediate, I mean. There are three ways not to become infected with HIV. The first way, the 100% way not to become infected, is through abstinence, which means no sexual activity whatsoever. The girls that I hang around with, they think that abstinence is a good thing because most, a couple of the girls that I know, they're not involved in a relationship. So I was like, they're not going to be involved in the casual flings, one night stands, or whatever. They think that um, the abstinence is the best way to prevent like STDs, HIV, AIDS, or anything, pregnancy, or whatever. They say that, you know, it's like, there's no way I can get it because, I mean, I just don't do it. Well, I think most of my friends, if they hear the word abstinence, they'll laugh at you. They'll think, well, you know, there's something wrong with you if you're not doing nothing or something like that. But it's different between a guy and a girl. Because a guy is just like for the one moment fling. But I mean, a girl got to think about getting pregnant and all that too, right? So mm. it's, it's basic. I think it is different for, for a guy and a girl to think about abstinence. But when guys really sit down and think about it, it's different. I mean, if I was to mention to my friends, you know, what do you think about abstinence? They say, <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you kidding? But like, when you when they say, no, seriously, now, it's, at first it's just this macho front that, the, yeah. you know, but when you say, you seriously think about it now, they say, well, yeah, I guess seriously it's the best way, and you know, not to catch anything. Mm -hmm. It's it not saying that they're going to go out and stop. But. Yeah, it is the best way, but yeah, it's it is. a hard way. Yeah. It's, a hard way it's, it's like they say, what's the, be what's, the, um, what's the best way not to prevent STDs? And say, not to have sex. What's the next best way? The second way is not to show needles for any purpose whatsoever. Either for injection drug use, tattooing, homemade tattooing, it's okay to go to a tattoo parlor and have them done it, provided they clean their instruments and their guns. Uh, ear piercing, done at home, and steroid use. There are two schools that I know of, I'm not going to name them, where uh, the guys uh, are using steroids and they're sharing needles with each other. The third way to protect yourself from HIV infection is to practice safer sex. Um, okay. If you're going to have sex, you have to use a latex condom. Okay. Some people think that condoms are 100% effective, and they are not. They are only as effective, as effective as they are as a means of birth control, and we know that people still get pregnant when they're using condoms. The reasons why they're not always 100% effective is because a lot of people mostly just don't know how to use them properly. There's different things you have to check for, expiry dates, um, whether or not the condom is lubricated. Some people use oil-based uh, lubricants on their condoms, such as Vaseline, and uh, that breaks down and deteriorates the condom and makes it no longer as protective, and it does not protect you anymore. Um, if you're going to use lubricant, you have to use a water-soluble lubricant. Your best bet if you're going to use condoms is to go to a drugstore or anywhere that you can, and they come with instructions and to read them. Like in a small community such as ours, most people or most people's parents know the pharmacist, so they're afraid to go into a pharmacy and buy condoms. So in a case like that, it's to our disadvantage because people who are having sex are having sex without condoms. A lot of the boys and the girls themselves too, they actually go to a different community further up or down the shore as the case may be, and they go into the drugstore there where absolutely no one knows them, and that's where they buy their condoms because they're afraid it will get back to their parents. Well, I've been in a mall, and I've seen young, well, not young boys, but 13, 14, do the same thing as if they were buying beer, give money to an older fella to go buy condoms for him. It's the same routine as if it was beer. 
I think that they should have those condom vending machines in the schools. Some parents are saying, well, if they're there for the 16-year-olds, the 13-year-olds are going to have, like, more opportunity to get them, so they're going to become more interested in sex quicker. I mean, that's where the teachers and the parents come in wrong. Because, I mean, if you put them in schools, maybe the people in the junior high are active. And then if you put them in schools, then there'll be a low risk for them to be get HIV or an STD or something. I mean, it's only for the good of the people. I mean, they're probably already up to it now. So it's just making it more accessible to them. Some people are like afraid I'll ruin the moment if we're in the middle of sex and I get to put on a condom and then some guys, you know, some guys are, are self-centered and they say, oh, well, I won't get as much out of it, so I won't bother unless she mentions it. And then you get cases where girls are there and they're saying, you know, well, I'm afraid to bring it up, I can't bring that up, you know. And sometimes it's just a lack, most of the time it's just lack of communication on both parts and, you know. Through that lack of communication, you ended up with a big problem. I've heard a lot of people saying that uh, they don't use condoms because it cuts down on the feeling of intercourse itself. And they say, well, it's like, I'm only getting it for tonight. I mean, it's like, I don't think she has it. Why use condom? Because it's like, I want the feeling, you know. It's, it's just being ridiculous, stuff they, like that. They got extra sensitive ones. <laughs> <laughs> and do they work? <laughs> right, so that's just a crock. That's all that is. You know, as far as going in for a drug, to a drugstore and buying condoms, I think that's absolutely ridiculous if they feel embarrassed. You know, sure, it's uncomfortable, and I know that it's embarrassing. It's something that you have to do if you're going to have sex. Um, if, you know, I, I just keep thinking, oh, God, my God, you think that's embarrassing? How embarrassing do you think it is to go home and tell your family that you've tested positive for HIV or that you have to go to an AIDS clinic? Just walking into an AIDS organization for the first time is really embarrassing. When I was called by the health department, I, uh, you know, was tested that day. I remember saying to the woman that tested me, it was like, she walked in and said, Trudy, I'm sorry, but I don't have good news for you. And I just remember thinking, well, I said to her, well, that's okay, I already know. And I didn't cry, I didn't do anything. I, I'd already done that. And I just went in the bathroom when I got to the office, to the committee, and said, okay, I'm HIV positive. And I just stood there and, you know, looked in the mirror. I looked the same. I still, I didn't feel the same, but, uh, you know, I knew I would get through it. So it wasn't a shock. It was a slap in the face, and it wasn't nice, and I didn't like it. And I, and I do get angry, and I do get frustrated, and, and feel like, oh, my gosh, you know. But it's not uncontrollable. When I went home to tell my mom, because, you know, like that old boy, you know, it's time to tell mom, and I walked in with this friend and somebody from the AIDS committee, and she didn't know this person either. Um, all these strangers, she kind of had an idea, and she just dragged me in my room kind of thing, and she just said, well, I heard the rumors about, and uh, I said, yeah, and she said, well, is it true? And I said, yeah, and she, she still looked at me and said, well, what about you? And I said, yes, and she said, oh, my, I can't handle this, and she just put her head on my shoulder and started to cry a little bit. She's been really supportive. She's gotten a lot of information and stuff like that. She's involved with the committee also. She's okay. I, I'm so glad I'm not a mother with a child that's HIV positive. I wouldn't be able to handle it at all. I'm glad I'm the one in that. Or I'm glad it's not my mom or my sister or somebody else in my family. Maybe one. <laughs> Maybe one, okay. The worst thing also, and I keep saying the worst thing is this and the worst thing is that, because when it comes into my mind at that time, it is the worst thing. Um, I think it's, you know, seeing my friends and, know, and you know, when they look, kind of, sometimes they kind of look at me kind of strange, and you know they're looking at you and they're thinking, oh my God, she's dying. And uh, that, that's kind of scary because it's really uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me and I feel really badly for them. I have a friend who um, is on the quilting project, and that's uh, quilts that are made for people that have died of AIDS. And uh, he... Uh, he, he's on that group, uh, the volunteer group at the AIDS committee, and uh, he said to my sister one day that I'm sitting down doing these quilts for people I don't even know, and I get so emotional because I sit here and it pops in my head, oh my God, one of these days I'm going to be making one of these for Trudy. I, I get so weak when I hear those things. Like, I wish you just didn't tell me that. A lot of my friends, right, like, 
we all used to be hanging around, right, and just, you know, going out with whatever moved, right? Anything, <laughs> anything that had a heartbeat, so... <laughs> no. We had... We, 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 we got out of that, and we just... Oh, we got... All, we all got girlfriends now, and everything's pretty calm. There's still a few of my friends that still like it, and they're really getting... In high risk. But, uh... A lot of them, right, because of this... This HIV scare, they just, uh... Calm down, took it easy, right? Your partner cannot give you a guarantee that they're not infected unless they've been tested. Your partner may not know that he or she is infected, and you may not necessarily know if you are. Who do you go up to? I think the reason most people would not want to get tested is because they'd rather not know. They'd rather th go on thinking that possibly they're, they don't have AIDS or HIV rather than know for sure. Just the shame of it all, right? Just going into the AIDS clinic and people seeing you going in, right, automatically it goes all over your community, right, saying, oh, such and such got AIDS, or he thinks he's got AIDS, or he could have AIDS, or, you know, it's just... I'd say if I was going to get tested, I'd probably go to town somewhere, so just so it wouldn't get back around. There are anonymous testing sites in Newfoundland and uh, they're cropping up all over the place. Not all communities have them right now. But your public health nurse will direct you to a place where you can go to have anonymous or confidential testing. Um, nobody knows who you are, or you, you don't have to give your name. They give you a number, and uh, your results, when they come back, are given only to you. You do have to go through pre- and post-test counseling um, in, in case you do test positive, or you continue to have the at-risk behaviors that you thought might put you at risk anyway. And uh, if you call into the Newfoundland Laboratory AIDS Committee, they will also tell you where you can get tested. Well, I think that if you, if you do have HIV or AIDS, that uh, most of the people around you with, would withdraw because they don't, they're not well informed about it. They, they would withdraw. They, you know, they probably discriminate against you. You'd probably lose all your friends. I know a person who has AIDS in this. They don't go anywhere. We never see them around. Just stay in. And one of my friends is not allowed to associate with this person. Well, that's what his parents said. His parents said, I don't want you down there associating with this person because, you know, this person has AIDS. But, like, he doesn't listen, of course. But uh, she doesn't go anywhere. She stays in. And she just she doesn't associate with us anymore. I feel really uncomfortable when I come home to my home community. Um, somebody in this community did have AIDS and did die of it, and she wasn't received very well around here. And it makes me kind of paranoid. Um, my family has told me, and my mom has told me, that the community has been very supportive of them, so I don't know how they would be towards me. I suppose they would be the same. And uh, it's, it's just scary coming home anyway. I get really paranoid as soon as I see the sun. I'm like, can we please turn around now? But it's not as bad as what it was before when I used to come back here. I don't come back very often. It'll go away. I'd like for it to go away, that feeling. Just really <laughs> scared and tense to come back. So it's like we have to sit down and explain to our parents. And basically, it's the parents are hearing the truth, the myths, and the facts, and like the r myths and rumors. And they're trying to sort out what's true and what's not and all that. So it's like they're a little bit mixed up. And when we come back and tell them these certain things, they ask us, well, how do you know, right? And we, we say, well, our friends told us, and the public health nurse backed it up. Or we just say we went and asked a doctor, or we asked someone who actually knew about it. And this usually, Parents are informed by what teenagers know. There's a lot of different reasons why I do some of the things I do with the committee and outside of the committee. Um, for one thing, it's, it's empowering myself and it's a way of having control over a situation that, you know, I really don't have any control over. I really like the Newfoundland Laboratories Committee. I feel at home there and it is like home. It's, it's where I belong.
people have made up the most bizarre kind of excuses they possibly can for continuing the at-risk behaviors that they're having, and there is no excuse. And if you contract it, it is your fault, and you better be willing to deal with it. Um, there's no excuse for not having a condom, and there's no excuse for not being able to get clean needles. You, if you want to have sex, and you think that you are mature enough to have sex, you will find a way to go about it in a good, protective, safe way, a healthy way. And basically what it comes down to is that if you can't find ways to protect yourself or alternative ways of showing sexual, sexual affection for someone else, then you are not ready to have sex, and you shouldn't be having it. You were just not ready. And, we, and if you continue not to go around not using condoms and doing all of those things, we're going to see you again. It's going to be an AIDS clinic or an STD clinic. Or you're going to get pregnant or something's going to happen, but you're not going to get off scot-free. Something's going to happen. I mean, with everything going on these days, I mean, you've got no choice but to talk about it. And there's no easy way to do it. I mean, just come right in and say it. You can't sugarcoat it. 